So welcome. Um, I'm Marie Harvey, Associate Dean for Research in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences, and I'm delighted to see all of you here in person. And I also want to welcome all of you who are coming in via Zoom. Um, we are uh, delighted to have a, a speaker from our college today speaking on a very uh, relevant a public and emerging public health concern. And um, we're also delighted to have Molly Kyle here. She is a professor in the Environmental, Occupational, and Health Program and has uh, agreed to moderate this session and to introduce our speaker. And she'll tell, say a little bit more about how people online can ask questions at the end. Okay, Molly, take, take it away. I'm gonna take advantage of the six foot rule here. I know, me too, it was <laughs> a lot easier. <laughs> the glasses are able to read, I can't. I know. It's become like the comfort zone. So it's a pleasure to introduce Perry Heistad. Uh, for those of you don't, who might not know his academic background, proving that public health brings people from everywhere, he got his bachelor's and his master's in geography uh, from the University of Victoria, and then his PhD from the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia in 2013. And again, for those of you who might not know this fun trivia fact, I was the head of the search committee that landed him and we offered him a job the day he got his PhD <laughs> because we saw something in him that has just uh, been... I really remember that voice now. Yeah, which just uh, has proven us right. Um, so it's been so much fun having Perry on the faculty and we're so glad that we were able to entice him here to OSU uh, because he has tremendous experience in spatial epidemiology, risk assessment, and air pollution, which he has continued to evolve and move into climate change and built environment uh, during his tenure here. He also helped to establish CARIX in Canada, which is a nation, nationwide uh, risk assessment framework for occupational and environmental hazards. Uh, and he also served as a research consultant for Health Canada and Environment of Canada, all starting when he was a master's student and through his PhD. So for those of you who are just starting out, Perry can give some uh, great uh, personal experience as to how you can lean into opportunities starting uh, very young that help to shape careers down it the line. <laughs> it does, but uh, it gets you a job that you yes. graduate. Uh, his research focuses on health in place and really probes the environmental factors that contribute to why zip codes are a better predictor of health than our genetic code, at least in the United States. Uh, he's established a spatial health lab at OSU, and his research studies literally span the world. Uh, I think he it's 27 countries, 28 countries in total. Yeah. Uh, that he has boots on the ground doing measurements. Uh, he's an incredibly prolific uh, researcher. He has about 90 publications, three book chapters, multiple government reports, and approximately $16 million in federal grants to support his research. And he's a very committed teacher. So he's taken over the 513 integrated uh, core course. He also teaches our GIS and public health class and a few other things around, and we always grab him for guest lectures. So he's received many honors in his career, including being selected as one of the very few epidemiologists, I believe, who got the NIH director's, uh, what was it, Early Independence Award. Normally that goes to bench scientists. And uh, on top of all of this, since he's been here, or shortly before he got here, he has three beautiful kids and he even coaches like little leagues and stuff like that. The guy is just uh, beyond belief. So he's genuinely one of the nicest people um, I've ever met and a great person to go have a beer with and one of the best colleagues uh, I hope so. It's so much fun to have you here. Thank you, Molly. Wow, I like that uh, introduction. <laughs> You're going way back in the bio there. Yes, that's scary, man. Um, all right, well, thanks everyone for being here. Um, people online. It does feel weird without the mask. Wow. Um, put this on here. Okay, let's see if this works. Um, okay, as, as Molly mentioned, I run the Spatial Health Lab here, and we do a lot of environmental research around health in place. Um, this includes air pollution, uh, urban green space, healthy built environments, um, as well as really trying to use new technology and big data to look at these questions. And so, how do we incorporate? 
better measurements of exposure, better health data into these into this type of research. Um, but one of the most pressing overriding environmental issues is climate change. And so for a long time now, I've been sort of mulling over what is needed in this area from someone who brings a specific toolkit in environmental epidemiology, what can I contribute uh, to this question? And today is really research that's been done to a certain point, as well as ideas that I'm hoping to write into a grant, um, probably this early spring with new money coming up. So uh, this graph shows um, future warming with what is, can, let's see if I can do this laser here. Is that this one? That's definitely not that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the computer off button. Okay, I'm just gonna point. So this is what's gonna happen if we cut emissions to zero, right? The earth is warming. Um, blue is a aggressive reduction strategy. Uh, green is moderate and red is we don't do anything. Um, based on the discussions that are going on right now in Glasgow, we are not looking good in terms of where we're going to end up. So the best predictions right now is by 2100, we're going to increase globally at 2.7 degrees um, Celsius. So that is a lot of warming that's going to induce a lot of changes. And this is not new in terms of the urgency and what this means for public health. So this is a commentary that was released in September. This was jointly released by over 200 medical journals, um, basically making the case that the most urgent public health threat is climate change and we need to do something about it now. Right? This came out during the COVID pandemic, uh, during the height of the Delta surge, um, which, which really says something in terms of what um, the medical field thinks is one of the major threats um, to public health. This is just an example. I like showing this in terms of grounding what this might mean. This is, um, I live in Portland. What is Portland going to feel like in 2100? So a summer in Portland is going to feel like Southern California. And so that really tends to bring it home for people. But this isn't something that's going to happen in the future. Right. This is something that is happening now. Everybody that was here this summer uh, experienced the uh, extreme heat event. This is showing the historical um, temperatures for Portland, and those were the uh, daily maximums for three days in July. So in Portland, it got to 117 degrees. Even though we knew this was coming, right? there was preparations for this, you still see this major increase in excess deaths. So this is coming close to what we saw in the winter surge during COVID. This is a city that has resources, that has public health warnings, and still we're seeing this uh, excess. So it's not just temperature, there's a lot of ways that climate influences health. Um, I'll go over this a little bit more once I get into how we're trying to apply this to Pure, but it's a lot more than temperature. There's a lot of complicated direct impacts. And so a lot of times when people think about climate and health, they're thinking about heat, right? Extreme heat events. Um, but there's drought, there's food insecurity, there's in increases in air pollution, there's the stress and mental health impacts, there's migration. So there's really this complicated web of how a changing climate is going to Im impact um, disease. And overriding all of this is who is most susceptible. So this map shows a climate change vulnerability index. Um, there's a lot of different things go into this, but there are also very clear patterns. We're getting some comments from Zoom that the audio is chopping. I'm wondering if your fan being in the pocket, in the pocket. That is impacting as well, because that was really clear for a while. Might be my cell phone. Okay. How's that? We'll, we'll give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> Here, let's go in here. Because it was really clear for a minute. And I can move this up as well. Is that better? I think so. OK. Um, so we see these really clear patterns, right? Um, developing low and middle income countries are going to be the most vulnerable to climate change. They are also the countries that contributed the least to anthropogenic forcing. Is that better? Yeah. This yeah? Is OK. Um, and, and where health comes in, especially with what I'm going to be talking about, um, is when we look at the transition of disease, 
um, from infectious disease to non-communicable disease, disease in the world. So this is a map showing disability adjusted life years. You see a lot of similarity between these patterns and the patterns of climate vulnerability. We see this increase in non-communicable diseases. That's not saying that communicable diseases are not important, um, but this piece here is becoming a lot more important in low and middle income countries. So these are uh, estimates from the Global Burden of Disease Study. This is ran out of Seattle. This is the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. Uh, I do a lot of work with them on air pollution, um, where they look at what are the leading causes of disease in the world, which is shown here. Um, cardiovascular disease is now by far the leading cause of disability adjusted life years. And they also try to look at modifiable risk factors. So what are the modifiable risk factors that are leading to this um, disability adjusted life years, um, as well as different um, health outcomes? So this is looking at uh, metabolic, behavioral, environmental risk factors that can be modified. Um, you see air pollution from both outdoor and indoor sources is now ranked number five. Um, but when you look at these causes and you think about some of the changes that um, climate change might induce, all of these could be impacted in one way or the other. There's really been very little research that looks at climate related exposures and pathways to chronic disease, especially when we think about the development of chronic disease and not just acute triggering of chronic disease. So these are the main questions I think need to be filled in this area. Um, determine how climate change will influence human health, especially chronic disease. Inform policy choices to limit the adverse health impacts of climate change. Identify co-benefits. So this is a really big one in terms of if we implement policies now to address climate change, what immediate benefits will those have to health? So not climate change that's uh, gonna occur 50, 100 years from now, but immediate benefits to health associated with those policies. And then we also know that warming is gonna happen no matter what. So how do we adapt and make communities, individuals more resilient to these changes that we know are coming? So these are big topics, right? Each one of these um, is a whole research area in itself. But to me, it's still amazing how little has been done in all of these. If we think, I mean, we've known about climate change for decades. Um, we know the general changes that is going to happen, but there still has been this challenge of tying it to health. Um, and that's due to um, the toolkits we have, right? We can apply our EPI toolkit directly to climate. Um, we need to work in bigger teams to try to address this problem. So that's what I'm trying to do in this pure climate study. So I think most of you might have heard of PEER from some of my other work, but this is the uh, Prospective Urban and Rural Epidemiological Study. This is ran out of um, McMaster University in Canada. Right now it has, uh, I think it's over 200,000 individuals. These are adults, 35 to 70 years of age when they're enrolled. Um, each one of these stars on this map represents a community. So a community in an urban area is a neighborhood. So you're they're sampling adults from selected neighborhoods. Um, in rural areas, they represent a small village. And so for each one of these clusters, half of those people enrolled are from urban areas, half are from rural areas. This started in 2004 in India as a pilot um, and has grown uh, since then. So this is the base pure data where um, they have a lot of really detailed information. This is ran by cardiologists. 15 years ago, they were way ahead of their time in terms of what they were thinking of in terms of determinants of cardiovascular disease. So they really wanted to focus on, we know a lot of these individual behaviors, smoking, diet, alcohol use, that are risk factors for cardiovascular disease, but what is driving differences in those factors? So they wanted to really focus on this community environment, household environment, down through biological markers to clinical events. So these are the data collection tools that exist for PURE. Everyone who was enrolled um, gave blood and urine. They did a, a medical exam, blood pressure, lung function, and a whole bunch of surveys. So this is really um, a wealth of 
not only health information, but information on individuals, households, and the communities they live in. Originally, going way back, um, I was planning on doing a postdoc with them to add air pollution to this study. And um, sorry, this is another summary of what's in, in, the, in, the, in the cohort. And what really drove me to say, we need to look at air pollution within Pure was some of the preliminary data that was coming out. And this was after five years. Um, so they published this, this, these descriptive statistics. This was, I think this was in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed this is the um, difference in incidence rates for cardiovascular disease in death across high, middle and low income countries. So you see this very sharp gradient where you have higher incidence, higher risk within middle and low income countries. Within the same um, publication, they looked at what is the trend in the known risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So everything that we typically look at, smoking, age, sex, cholesterol, um, diet, physical activity, how does that relate to the incidents we're seeing? And so here they have it broken out by urban and rural communities, but you see a reverse pattern. So in high income countries, they had by far higher risk factors compared to low income countries that had lower risk factors. But if you go back to the actual um, incidence, they have higher rates of cardiovascular disease. So something is obviously missing here. And so I hypothesized that air pollution was playing a role here in terms of higher air pollution in these countries. Another grant um, said it was um, preventative care and healthcare access that was driving these disparities. Um, spoiler alert, it ended up being both, right? Both of them contributed to this. Um, but these are really striking patterns. Um, and this was, this was really the data that led to pure air. So this was the early independence award I received when I first moved here. Basically taking pure and adding in an air pollution exposure assessment component looking at lung function and then different types of health analyses. And the major challenge of this grant was how do we actually look at air pollution across all of these diverse communities? So we did a lot of work where um, we took geospatial information and estimated different outdoor models. Um, we actually did air pollution measurements. Um, so in 2,500 households and in 1,500 individuals, so they wore a personal monitor. Um, they had GPS, we did questionnaires, and we took all this information and did different types of health analyses. So we published a lot of stuff looking at what drives exposure, how do, that, how does, how do those exposures relate to different health outcomes, um, and found some interesting things. And so looking at what happens at the high exposure area. But the paper that received the most attention by far, so this was published not even two years ago, um, and I think it's been cited 400 times, is basically replicating the burden of disease study within one cohort, within PURE. So the GBD is basically a big meta-analysis where they take everything, look at exposure response, and then apply that to exposure data to estimate burden. So we tried to do that within one study using exactly the same models, right? So the same model, same adjustment, looking at different risk factors. Um, and what was interesting and what was good is we saw similar patterns. So this is for cardiovascular disease. Hypertension was by far the greatest risk factor followed by cholesterol. Household air pollution was third. Um, and this was something that was really interesting because even though um, the cardiologists who run Pure semi-believed in air pollution <laughs> after five years of me giving talks on it, um, I don't think it really sunk in until they saw this, right? Until they saw the results with their own data, with analyses that they could look at and understand to see how important this was compared to the things that they talk about and worry about all the time, right? The behavioral risk factors. Um, outdoor air pollution alone accounted for 14% of um, cardiovascular disease. So this was a really powerful analysis um, that sort of finished up the pure air study. And now what I wanna do is try to take this, right? And think about what is this gonna to do to all of those risk factors that we're able to measure in pure as well as associate with health outcomes. How do we fit um, climate change into um, 
into this framework. Um, this is from the IPCC report that's specifically looking at uh, the human health impacts and what we need to do in terms of um, understanding those impacts. How do we adapt and how do we start um, maximizing these co-benefits for policies? And these are just two statements that really stood out to me in, in this report um, <clears throat> that we really don't know much, especially in low income countries. And that's not surprising because there's been relatively little epidemiology done in low income countries because we don't have the data, right? So to run a prospective cohort in a developing country is very challenging and takes a lot of money, um, a lot, a lot of money. Um, but there, there is now longitudinal data where we can start doing this. So not looking at what's gonna happen in the future, but actually measuring what has changed now and how that's associated with health. Um, and that, that is PURE. I mean, PURE is the, one of the only cohorts that I can think of that can do this across different countries. And so if we're thinking about looking at some of the direct impacts of climate change, so extreme heat, extreme cold, but also looking at storms, floods, right? We can measure those over decades using satellite information. So we have this information available. And when we just looked um, sort of back of the envelope, taking a global flood hazard map, overlaying it with, um, I don't think I did that. <laughs> Megan. <laughs> overlaying it with uh, pure communities. <laughs> I did that. <laughs> so we see that 15% of the, the pure communities are located in areas that have the highest flood risk, right? And so you see we have communities in, um, in Bangladesh outside of Dhaka. And so those are extreme flood risk communities. Um, we can also look at a range of different indirect health impacts. And so this is doing the same thing, but this is now looking at drought risk. So 35% of the peer communities are in really high drought risk areas. And so this could translate into food security, right? A whole bunch of um, different stress pathways. But these are things that are really hard to get at using observational data. Um, so we need more information to try to get at these indirect pathways from these broad changes to uh, what health impacts actually are. Um, and this is really what I'm trying to do with this grant. What other type of information do we need to add to PEER to get at acute extreme weather impacts as well as this long-term indirect exposures? This is an example of um, the type of analyses we can do. This isn't published yet in PURE, but this is our first attempt to say, is there an association between acute temperature and mortality? This is fairly well characterized. There's been hundreds of studies that have done this where you take longitudinal hospital records, add daily temperature, and then look at that association. Again, most of that has been done in large cities in uh, rich countries that have that health data. And so this paper is trying to say, do we see similar patterns in low in income um, countries, as well as what makes people more resilient and susceptible? So yes, if we're expecting to see this U-shaped relationship, how does it change based off of the type of community you live in, um, the resources that your, your household has? Um, and this was uh, led by JP, so he graduated last year. Um, and unfortunately, this, this has stalled because he is now in the COVID world. Um, and he is uh, that, doing the EIA fellowship, so he is um, very, very busy right now. But this was a very interesting analysis that um, used a, a, a different approach than what we normally use in PURE. So this was a case crossover analysis where we have the date of all the deaths that happened. So if somebody, somebody died um, on March 15th, we can take the temperature on the day they died, the temperature on a couple days or a week before they died, and then compare it to control temperatures. So this is for the same person taking the control temperatures for the same day for the two weeks before and the two weeks after. So we're only using cases in this analysis. Um, that is still challenging because PURE is all over the world and we don't have meteorological stations in all those areas. So this is where we use um, some really cool um, NASA satellite data along with the Google Earth Engine. So the Google Earth Engine is basically Google took every publicly available satellite image that's ever been collected, 
put it on their servers and let you use their servers to analyze it. So doing global analyses, that would take normally years to do, you can do in a week. Um, and so that really enabled us to look at the, the globe and assign daily temperatures for a 20 year period. Um, and, and JP spent months to years trying to, try to figure this out. So he gets, he gets all the credit for this. Um, this is just showing where we have peer communities, where we have uh, monitoring stations. And when you look at the satellite based product and where we have measured temperature, we see a really strong correlation. So we can use this um, model, daily model for the world to look at changes in um, short term temperature. And so um, we found this strong U shaped relationship. So at colder temperatures, as you increase, um, that's beneficial to health. So here we're using, if you look at temperatures under 20 degrees Celsius, for every one degree increase, there's a 4% reduction in mortality. So this is a, a, a one degree increase for the day that someone died. Um, so increasing temperature is good at, at cold temperatures. When we look at uh, locations where it was over 20 degrees, um, we see a 9% increase in mortality and an 8% increase in cardiovascular disease mortality associated for a one degree increase. So this um, was fairly similar to what the meta-analyses showed. Um, one of the things that we're still trying to figure out um, is how do you look at what's called the minimum mortality temperature? So this is based on those hundreds of studies that I um, said earlier, where they looked at like really good data and where's the minimum mortality in this U-shape relationship. And so this makes analyses very challenging. We, we chose 20 as the minimum mortality for, this, for the pure cohort that was based on the average. Um, but in India, that can be 30 degrees, right? That's the ideal temperature for mortality versus Vancouver, um, it's around 15 or 17, I think. And so this is really interesting when we're thinking about climate um, impacts because humans adapt, right? This is adaptive capacity to temperature. How long that takes, if we can speed that up in the framework of climate change where we're, we're, we're experiencing half degree increases potentially over five years um, is a question we just don't know, right? This, this adaption happened over a long time. Um, and so now we're rerunning that analysis basically where we're moving that minimum mortality to the 20 degrees to what it should be for each center. So if you're doing an analysis of pure in India, that's set at 30. If you're doing it in Sweden, that's set at 15. Um, and so it's gonna be interesting to see how much things change because this is probably an underestimate of the true association because we're using that 20 degree cutoff. Um, so that, that was the work JP was working on before he had to go off to um, the CDC. So we'll see when he reemerges. What am I doing for time? Um, okay, so that's, um, that was short term, right? So that's, that's an exposure that's fairly well characterized. Lots of studies can do this, but what about long term? And I call it temperature change here. Um, cause I'm still like hesitant to say climate cause that's on the order of decades. Um, but if we look at 10 to 20 year changes in annual temperature, do we see associations with health outcomes? And this is really that indirect component. So if we just look at the rate of change, the rate of variability, does that impact health? And this is very, very exploratory. I, I had no idea what to expect with this analysis. Um, so this is basically saying, okay, these are three pure communities. So we have 700 of these. We look just at an example of, we have um, the annual mean temperature. We have annual mean temperature, we have variability, we have summer maximum. We have all of these characteristics of um, long-term temperature over this 20 year period. So this is just looking at the rate of change. Um, so the slope, if you take a linear slope and look at the rate of change by community. And so that's trying to get at that adaptive capacity. So is there a rate of change that's too quick for people to adapt to? Um, if we look at all cause mortality, so we have 
um, temperature rate of change, and then just a baseline annual temperature. We don't see anything with all-cause mortality, but we see this 9% increase with cardiovascular disease events. And again, this is very exploratory, but we see this like rate of change is important, but the actual magnitude of the temperature isn't. Right, and so the, the, this difference between communities is not, is not making a difference, it's this rate of change. Um, and so I think this leads to some really interesting hypotheses in terms of what are the pathways that could be leading from um, climate changing to this increase on cardiovascular disease. And we see really large differences when we start drilling down um, by low, middle, and high income countries, by urban versus rural communities. Um, so it's a 16% increase in rural communities for cardiovascular disease, where we see no association in urban communities. And so this could be a range of, of different factors, but those are the things I think we need to determine in terms of what makes communities resilient to these type of changes. So that could be air conditioning as an obvious one. Um, and so taking this type of information and integrating it into how do we make communities adapt and be more resilient. And I really like this commentary. Um, it was focused on cities, but it said we need to take technological solutions, um, we have social solutions, and then we have nature-based solutions. And how do we take those different components and figure out what is the best way to adapt them um, to address this issue? And so we've done some work looking at green space, so exposure to nature in Pure. I do a lot of green space and health research in North America, in Canada. But again, there really hasn't been anything done in low income settings, right? Um, and it seems very naive to say we're going to take results from Europe um, and Canada and the States and say that same association is going to apply in, in China and India and Bangalore and Tanzania. Um, so in Pure, we took three different measures of green space. So we have a satellite measure, which looks at uh, what's called the normalized difference vegetation index. So all green vegetation, basically. <clears throat> and we derive measures for Pure communities. And then we had surveys that asked people if they had trees in their neighborhood that provide shade, um, as well as if they could walk to a park in five, 10, 15 minutes. And so we used these three measures to look at a range of different um, outcomes and pathways in PURE. So the, the first um, looks at, for example, increase in green space could lead to decreased air pollution. And so these little arrows here basically say for all three of our different green space exposure measures, we saw decreases in NO2 and PM2.5 air pollution. So community green space went up, air pollution levels went down. We also had individual measures of um, walking and recreational physical activity. So more green space, closer to parks, you should be walking and exercising more. Um, we only saw that with one of our green space measures, and I think that was distance to parks. So this is really looking at all of these pathways that green space could um, influence health. Um, we, lo we looked at um, social capital, um, neighborhood satisfaction, there were um, like three times increases in the odds of being satisfied with where you live if you were in a greener neighborhood. So these were really strong associations as well as associations with stress and depression um, for two of the measures. We then had all of these physiological markers that were measured in PURE. So we had BMI, obesity, grip strength, uh, blood pressure, hypertension, and lung function. And the consistency of these associations with what we hypothesized would happen was really remarkable. We see decreases in BMI, increases in grip strength, decreases in hypertension, and increases in lung function. Um, and then we had our prospective events, right? So within the prospective cohort, do we see associations between green space at baseline or a time-bearing measure and outcomes? And so here, the strongest association was actually a gain for cardiovascular disease, a decrease of around 7% um, with the satellite-based measure of NDVI, and a very small association between parks and non-accidental mortality. So these associations were fairly small, even though a 7% um, decrease is, is still um, fairly substantial. 
But I wouldn't really expect this to be that big, right? If we're talking about low and middle income countries, there's a lot of other things going on. Um, so this, I mean, this is not within a climate framework, but this is what should be in a climate framework when thinking about co-benefits, right? In Glasgow right now, they're talking about all of these um, forest initiatives where they're buying huge plots of land, developing, planting trees. Um, that same thing could be done in cities, right? So instead of planting those in the forest, we're gonna plant those in cities where there's the health co-benefit. So there's a lot of like creative things we can do with this type of um, information. And so this really takes me to the sort of next steps of where I'm going with this. Um, and it, I think it's really good timing. So um, NIHS just uh, released or or put in their um, document, they received $100 million for climate and health research. And so um, November 29th is the council open session where they're going to be talking about what they should do with this, uh, with this money. Um, there's a lot of pent up demand for this. So unfortunately, under the last administration, you could not even write climate in a proposal. Um, you had to refer to disasters or you had to frame it as something totally different. Um, so there will be a lot of demand for this money, but this is a huge opportunity. Um, and so I, I think there'll be a lot of um, planning that needs to be done in the next couple months. So this is what I'm thinking um, of what is needed next for, for this type of research and what I'm hoping to put in the grant. So the first one is just assessing and attributing um, direct and indirect climate exposures to chronic disease. And I'll talk a little bit more about the attribution component. Um, the second one is to develop a building resilience to disaster effects framework. And so the CDC has their uh, BRACE framework, but how do you take that and apply it in a low-income setting? Um, and then AIM-3 is to look at, at projections. So can we project future health impacts from different climate futures, um, as well as different levels of resilience? And so using this BRAID framework to inform um, those projections. So it's interesting, this attribution, um, I've been working with people from CIOS around one of your pilot or $10,000 grants a couple of years ago. Um, and they were really interested in this attribution component and it wasn't even on my radar. I didn't really understand what they were talking about, but they were really keen on saying, well, if we see this health impact from um, extreme weather, let's attribute that back to country specific climate forcing that what is their specific role and responsibility in that health effect. Um, and I didn't really think that was needed, but now I really think it's needed in terms of making a direct link to um, anthropogenic driven climate change and human health impacts. So what this basically does um, is you run climate models, you take out the anthropogenic climate forcing, you run those models again, and then you look at the probability of that event happening. So if there was no um, human induced climate, forcing, would this event have happened or not? And it gives you a probability. And so this has been done a lot with specific like disasters, but it has not been attached to health. And so taking the types of epidemiological analyses I presented and applying this attribution framework, I think will be really powerful for making that um, link specifically to climate change, right? So not just saying this was a acute temperature, but this was acute temperature driven by climate, human induced climate change. Um, this is the, the CDC uh, BRACE framework, so building resilience against climate effects. This has been applied, I think, in six or seven counties in Oregon now. There were specific grants to do this, um, but this takes a lot of expertise. This takes a lot of resources to implement it, even here in the US. So how would you take something like this and apply it in a low-income setting to build resilience in low-income communities. And so that's really what AIM-2 is gonna be about in this grant, is how do you take this, develop a new framework, pilot that framework, test it, um, to see if it'll work in uh, a low-income setting. And part of this idea came out of um, an NGO in India called SEEDS. They are a massive, amazing organization that respond to disasters. And so they do a lot of climate work already, um, and they're really interested in applying some type of modified brace braid framework to the work that they do. 
Um, this would be a whole other proposal in itself, just focused on developing that, implementing it, and then evaluating it. Um, but they, they are very keen and see the value of trying to do this um, in India, but then also if we could expand it to other countries. And this is really important because all of this climate impacts happens locally. So we're gonna, we're planning on implementing a survey in Pure to individuals about climate and health impacts, but also really doing community focus groups, right? Community workshops to try to get a better understanding of what is happening locally. Um, and that will be part of this um, modified braid framework. <clears throat> um, and then what I, what I talked about previously of how do we use this information to project different scenarios? And this is really this what if scenarios. Um, and I've sort of been thinking about this as like simulation and, but we have real health data. So how do we put all this together? Um, and this is where Mary, one of my postdocs right now is like, oh, that's G computation. You got You need to use G computation. I'm like, I have never heard of that. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Um, but from the readings that, that I've done recently, I think it actually is the perfect tool to ask what if scenarios from a real health data set, right? So this is not doing um, risk assessment. This is not saying here's the exposure response, here's what we think is gonna happen in the future, let's do a simulation. This is taking the pure health data, the variation that's in it and saying, okay, if we take that structure and apply different climate futures, this is what's gonna happen. If we take different um, impacts of integrating a braid framework in terms of community resilience, this is what happens. And so I think having that top down versus bottom up approach is really, I mean, I think this will be really interesting for policy formation and just thinking through what, um, what the impacts are gonna be and then what, we, what can we do about them. So there's a lot of um, uh, collaborators that work on this. This is the pure team. Um, so I'm an adjunct at McMaster. Um, they're really a, an amazing group. They've, the PI has been running this for close to 20 years now. Um, he's never gonna stop <laughs> doing pure. <laughs> there's no retirement. Um, but it, it is a really amazing resource to look at environmental hazards as well as climate change, obviously. Um, so with that, that's all I have. Um, I welcome questions. We do have quite a few online. Oh, no, we don't oh. have any. Oh. <laughs> Fantastic presentation, uh, it was so impressive. Um, thank you again. Um, so uh, going back to the cardiovascular outcomes. Um, so um, cardiovascular disease has a long, a long time lag. I mean, between inception of the path of, uh, uh, early pathology of mm -hmm. atherosclerosis and the clinical outcomes, <coughs> which complicates things tremendously for the type of research you are doing. Uh, if you're looking at Right, in, if you're looking at temperature and cardiovascular events, you're mm -hmm. looking at the triggering, the, the acute effect, the triggering of the event, as opposed to, and that, you know, going back to your slide where you have discrepant trends in the um, incidence of cardiovascular event and mortality and the risk factors, uh, the composite score that you had, particularly for developing countries that are still early in the epidemiology transition. So I'm wondering how are you going to take that into consideration in your future studies in looking at the factors <laughs> climate or <laughs> particularly that affect the triggering of the acute events versus mm -hmm. the changes in risk factors that are occurring also as, the, as a consequence of the climate change, yep. physical activity increasing, et cetera, et cetera, mental health issues. Uh, how are you going to, um, how are you framing that? Um, those yeah. types of Cardiovascular disease epidemiology is challenging it is. for that reason because the, the determination <coughs> of cardiovascular disease events that you're observing now may have occurred 20, 30 years before in this yeah. Yeah, and so acute is definitely easier. Like the triggering of cardiovascular disease is way easier. Um, and this is fairly similar to air pollution when we were struggling with this in terms of um, what exposure period were we actually interested in. Um, and the nice thing about PURE is the median follow-up is around 10, 11 years right now. So when we look at baseline measures, I think we are capturing changes in risk factors and what impact they're having on cardiovascular disease risk. 
Um, and so with, with our climate models, we can go back 20 years um, and then also look at what's happening before they entered the cohort. So we have 10 to 20 to 30 years where we can look at these type of exposures. Um, it was fascinating to see how fast this epidemiological transition is happening. Um, and so like in, in, I mean, it's, it's done already in, in India and China and a lot of these countries, it's all chronic disease. Even in like rural India, very poor communities, it's diabetes, obesity, that are the main uh, health problems. Um, so I think the timing of PURE actually is perfect for capturing that super rapid transition that happened in a lot of these countries. Um, but yeah, the like cumul the cumulative impact of these risk factors is super challenging. Um, yeah. Um, thanks for your presentation. It was uh, something that I hadn't even done before. I'm trying to figure it out. But it was, uh, yeah, it was really helpful. Um, <laughs> this is what Perry does. You did already. So, did you study in spike in power? Are they existing and you're continuing to work with them? Are you adding to them? Like with some of the future grades that you were talking about, um, with looking at braid or brace, like are you, are you working in existing? Are you seeing new ones? So it's the same community. So they basically enroll people and then follow them to document health events. And so when we do like developing a new braid framework, we will go into a community and recruit from participants in the cohort already. Um, so they are recruiting some new sites, but everything that I use is the existing cohort that they're just following. And, and COVID has been super challenging. So basically for the last two years, all follow-up has stopped. They've tried to do phone follow-up, um, but in some countries that just doesn't work. Um, so that's been a real challenge. Um, I was actually on the phone with them this morning saying like, when is survey starting again? Is it possible to do this in two years? Um, and in two years, they think they'll be caught up to the schedule that they need to sort of keep things moving forward. Um, but the nice thing about Pure is that they've been in these communities for a long time, and so they're trusted, right? They know the every every region has a local PI that has their own field staff, um, and everybody knows them. And so, in some cases in India, they were like Pure, like paper maps, or they'd have like Pure ID on the door on their door, and like it was amazing to see 15 years of follow up what that looks like in a rural community. Um, and yeah, all of this stuff I would never be able to do without leveraging the infrastructure that they have. Even doing a survey is like 15 different languages, right? And so just stuff like that, that I totally take for granted. There's a lot of work that they have to do on the back end to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. That was fantastic. Um, I'm wondering how much pressure you're getting or how much interest you have in applying these same models to infectious disease because we're in that COVID era right now. Yeah, um, there's been some, and a part of that was there was this sort of hypothesis of like, does air pollution make COVID worse? Does it, does it increase transmission? Does it increase susceptibility? So there was a big push at the start of COVID to do that, but I don't think PURE is the best study. I mean, there's better data to try to get at that hypothesis here in the US or Canada. Um, I would say there's a lot of interest right now um, in climate. And so there's a lot of different groups that are trying to put together these really big climate and health proposals right now, um, and, and which is needed, which is, which is great. But it is like everybody is like throwing their hat in the ring to say there's funding, like we, we, we need to do this. Um, so the next six months, I think, are going to be really interesting. Well, I would think it would be similar, right, in terms of it's easier, maybe easier-ish to see acute effects versus <coughs> longer term, um, like ecosystem shifts yeah. that will lead us down a path towards more infectious disease in the future. Yeah, yeah, and there's a bit with um, there's a big. It's a Canadian. It's called a transformative grant, and so they're four million a year for six years. And so they want to do a climate and health, taking an HIV AIDS model, applying it. So it's an HIV AIDS model in a climate framework, applying it to infectious disease and then applying it to chronic disease um, as sort of like the transition of the different endpoints. Um, 
and it'll be interesting. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how how that actually works in the end. But yeah. Right. I'm not seeing if there's anybody have questions online, if you can drop them in the chat. Or in the QA. In the QA, sorry. Okay, so I have a quick question. Yeah. When in those Google temperature imputation maps that you have there, multiple interfaces, whatever it is, um, what's the resolution of that? How close is it? So the temperature is 10 kilometers. So it's daily temperature at 10 kilometers, um, but it depends on like, there's a lot of different products. So when we use like satellite NDVI, it's 30 meters. So we can get that detail in a community. Um, temperature is coarser. You can get like finer spatial detail, but then it won't be daily. And so we really wanted to, and actually the product we used was three hours. So we can look at like the difference between temperature in the day and temperature at night. And so that's, what really leads to a lot of the impact is if you don't cool down at night. Um, and so with this product, you can actually estimate that for different communities. Um, and so yeah, JP did a, like a ton of different work just on like, if we use the wet bulb globe temperature instead of just normal temperature and night versus day. And um, there was a lot of interesting things that came out just from like, how do you estimate what temperature is most important? Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.